family business back to 1880 when his great-grandfather, Morris Fred, started the blacksmith shop on Orchardale Road in Pike Township. Angstad, a 1963 graduate of Old Valley High School, has been employed his entire lifetime at the business he now co-owns. He is a contributor to Green Magazine and has made presentations to several John Deere two-cylinder clubs at various locations. A John Deere Model B is the first tractor that Pikeville Equipment has ever sold and is on display at the business with some 40 additional tractors that Donald and his son Michael currently own and exhibit. Um, if you would please welcome me in, uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Donald Shumshay. Thank you for the uh, introduction and uh, good evening. And Pull the you. microphone up a little, Donald. Yeah, yeah. Thank George, you. you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we got a problem. <laughs> Is this any better? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here and uh, uh, thank uh, you for the introduction. The uh, When they first asked me to uh, do a presentation, uh, I explained to Carl that I get very nervous in front of a crowd. And uh, he said, how nervous do you get? I said, I get as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> what are we going to talk about this evening? We're going to talk about uh, the man, John Deere. We're going to talk about his son, Charles Deere. The company that they created. And we're going to talk about... Uh, the history of Pikeville equipment, and then of course no presentation is complete without about two dozen slides. So we have slides of our collection here in Ole, over at the farm. But before I get started uh, and get too far into it, I always like to do uh, what we call tractor trivia. Uh, some of you guys were uh, involved in it before. I'll ask a question to the audience and uh, Whoever has the answer will uh, be awarded a John Deere pack of um, John Deere um, collector cards. Now there's a reason why we're giving these collector cards out. Uh, there's two reasons really. Number one, we ordered way too many of them, and number two, they don't sell. <laughs> does anybody, does anybody, is this better? All right. Can you everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, the question I have is for one pack of cards, what is the second oldest company on the New York Stock Exchange? The second oldest company on the New York Stock Exchange. Coca-Cola. Wow. <laughs> second oldest. Who am I talking about here? Hey, you got it. <laughs> Now the question that people always ask, if John Deere's the second oldest one, who is first? And that was DuPont. DuPont is the oldest uh, company on the stock exchange. While we're talking old, uh, I'd just like to start with uh, when my uh, great-grandfather started the business in 1880. He was uh, <coughs> selling domestic gasoline engines, he uh, uh, handled implements, and he uh, sold, um, and he was a blacksmith. The blacksmith was his trade. And the domestic engine, and I, later on in the slide program, I have some domestic engines that uh, you can see. It. But the part that I, uh, is neat, on those domestic engines, there's a brass nameplate, and it says, sold by uh, Morris Fretz, Pikesville, PA. So uh, when you go up to the uh, antique engine shows, like they had at the Apple Festival, you'll see a domestic uh, engine, and you can see that plate on top of it. The, uh, we're going to give a second uh, a batch of cards away. Uh, this one here is for the older people, the more mature individuals. Why is... Uh, the standard for um, planting corn, for planting anything before 1930, was 42 inches. 42 inches was the standard. Where did that come from? Exactly right. 
That was, that was the width of a horse and it is the cultivate. Thank you. What was the first tractor to be tested at Lincoln, Nebraska? Lincoln, Nebraska is where the Nebraska test uh, started. Uh, and the first, yeah, the qu question is, name me the model of the first tractor that was tested. Today, every tractor is tested at Lincoln, Nebraska. If you get a chance, if you get a chance to see it, there's a nice museum there, and you can tour the, uh, the, all the equipment they use to check the horse bar and the, uh, and the equipment. What was the answer? That is correct. What was, the, what was the answer? The answer was the Waterloo Boy. The Waterloo Boy tractor was the first John Deere. It was not called a John Deere, but Deere bought the Waterloo tractor plant in 1918. They paid two million, two and a quarter million dollars for that plant in 1918. Now they sold 20,000 uh, Waterloo Boys. So from 1918 to 1923, they sold 20,000 Waterloo boys. And that's a lot of tractors, but not when you compare it to Henry Ford. Henry Ford made the uh, uh, Fordson, and from 1918 to 1922, he had a half a million Fordson sold. So 20,000 was not a lot of tractors at that time. Then in 1923, is when they came out with the John Deere D, and of course, uh, that was more successful. I have pictures later on of our Waterloo boy in our collection, and I have a, uh, a early D in our collection. <coughs> this is a little bit of history here, too, and it's going to be a little difficult, but... Uh, I got some real John Deere enthusiasts here. They'll know the answer. There was always uh, competition between International Harvester and John Deere. Always was, a hundred years before this date. But uh, what year? What year? I'm looking for a year. Did John Deere surpass International Harvester in the sales of tractors and farm equipment? It's the same year I graduated. Are any of my classmates here? <laughs> You've got the answer. <laughs> now, what made John Deere successful in 1963? Uh, if you go back a couple years, uh, Deere and Company only made two cylinders up until 1959, 1960, and they uh, only had 17% market share. <coughs> Now, they were doing okay, but they knew if they wanted to, to grow, they had to get rid of the two cylinders. But they only had, out of every hundred tractors sold, only 17 were John Deere's. So, what they did in 1960, they had the introduction of what they called the new generation of power. Now, that new generation tractor was four and six cylinders. Model numbers were 10, 10, 20, 10, 30, 10, 40, 10. The, first, the lowest ones were built in uh, Dubuque, Iowa. The uh, bigger ones were uh, made in Waterloo, Iowa. Two different sets of engineers, two different tractors. All were made by, by the UAW, United Auto, Work, Auto Workers. It was all made by them. The understanding was that happened in, <clears throat> in the early years, the... Uh, The 2010 tractor would came out of Dubuque, and that tractor was built a little bit differently. That one had a five compartment transmission case, and the, uh, the first compartment and the last compartment was a dry compartment. The three middle ones were wet, they had oil in them. And this 2010 tractor uh, came from the uh, factory, brand new in 1960, never saw nothing like it before, but it didn't work. And the, uh, it got to the dealers, and uh, they had to fix it before they could deliver it. didn't work. So they pulled the rock shaft off the top of the tractor, the three-point hitch housing, off the top of the tractor, to look inside, 
at the, the PTO clutch to see what was wrong, and this was a dry compartment, they found a note in there from the factory. And he, he pulled, the mechanic pulled it out, read the note, and said, I couldn't get the damn thing to work either. <laughs> That was one of my favorite stories. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last pack of cards. What, what state was John Deere born in? Now you remember John Deere is a Midwestern company. They, uh, uh, most of their factories are out in the Midwest. But where was he born? Vermont. Illinois. <laughs> yeah. Who said Vermont? Vermont. Back there. Yes. He was born in Vermont, and I got up some dates there, and uh, I want to share it with you. <clears throat> he was trained, John Deere, the man, John Deere the man, was uh, trained as a uh, blacksmith. He uh, was born in 1804, and at age of 17, he was apprenticed to a blacksmith. blacksmith. He was, didn't have a lot of formal education. Uh, in uh, 1836, uh, he moved to Grand Detour, Illinois. He, uh, a friend of his moved out there and uh, wrote to him that they needed a blacksmith in the Midwest. This was uh, unsettled yet and uh, they needed a blacksmith so he packed up, moved out uh, in 1836, he moved to uh, Grand Detour, Illinois. And uh, he uh, went out there and the next year, in 1837, he fashioned a plow bottom out of an old saw blade. And this is what started the, the John Deere Plow Company. Uh, he, he did not invent the plow. John Deere did not invent the plow. What he did was invent the shape, the contour of the moldboard so it would scar. Scar is when a, you want the ground to clean. That a thick, sticky Midwestern soil would stick fast to the bottom. In 1839, he sold 10 plows. In 1841, he sold 75 plows. In 1842, he 100 plows. In 1848, he moved to Moline, Illinois. And when he moved to Moline, Illinois, the he gave the story later in his life, he only had $11 in his pocket. And that's what started that multi-million dollar corporation today. In 1849, with 16 employees, he had 2,000 136 plows manufactured, and by 1855, he was selling 10,000 plows a year. That's what made John Deere a millionaire, the plow business. In 1853, his son Charles Deere became part of the company. Charles Deere uh, was educated in uh, Chicago, he was a, uh, an accountant, a bookkeeper, and that's when he uh, was a bookkeeper at 16 with Deer and Company. And in 1858, uh, they called it a financial panic. I guess today we'd call it a recession or a downturn, whatever. But uh, he took over the, the as president of the company at that time, and he is one of the unsung heroes of the company. Uh, Charles Deer never got the credit he should have uh, got. He uh, he was at the helm of the company for 49 years as president of the company. And he transformed the company from a local um, plow manufacturer to a national uh, machinery manufacturing company. Now, the unfortunate part about it is all these tractors that you see running around that say John Deere on them, Charles Deere, John Deere, never ever saw that. This, they, were, they died before the, uh, the Waterloo uh, Gas Engine Company was purchased. Now what I'd like to do is uh, just go over a few slides. If everybody's awake yet, they'll be asleep shortly when they go through slides. <laughs> this, this slide here is uh, two of my favorite tractors. The 430 and the 330, both are made in Dubuque, Iowa. 
the same place that the owner of the same guy made that that wrote the note. <laughs> this is a 430 high crowd. <coughs> this one here uh, belonged to um, Mr. Monroe from um, New Jersey. I bought it at his public auction. It's only, it's, I'm only the second owner, and I have the title from New Jersey for the track that he titled that in New Jersey. That's a 330 and a 430. <coughs> that 330, that 330 was one of the uh, least produced tractors John Deere made. They only built uh, 844 of them. What was, uh, it was a great little tractor, but the price of that tractor compared to the next one was, the 430, was just too little bit of difference and the people bought the bigger one. <coughs> and what they don't say, that's what uh, John Deere claims, but uh, they don't tell you that uh, the Farmall Cub was being sold at the same time and everybody bought the Farmall Cub. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is one of my favorite tractors here. Uh, <coughs> That's why I brought this painting, uh, this print here, and I have that, uh, yeah, thank you. This print here, and I have that um, uh, loose leaf notebook. <coughs> this uh, tractor belonged to uh, Russell Stahl. Now, Russell Stahl was a potter. Does anybody here know, ever hear about Stahl's pottery? Yeah. Hey, great. This tractor ran the pugger. I never knew what a pug machine was. But it was used to mix clay for the potter. And that's what this machine, uh, this tractor would use. They, when the, uh, they had a 1910 International on it, a uh, gas engine, and when that one started, they put the John Deere on it. Uh, Russell Stahl later on moved to the potter, the last potter, moved to uh, the Fredericksville Hotel. He bought the hotel. And am I right? Yes. Okay. And uh, they sent him the thirsty individual. <laughs> anyway, he parked the tractor in a fence row. It was just in terrible shape for whatever reason it got the fence row. And Julia Longacre, how many people know Julia Longacre? She is an artist from Valley, and uh, she painted this, uh, the John Deere Retired. Now, it's cute. Her husband, Newt Longacre, is a collector of machinery also, and he likes his old tractors. And uh, for Father's Day, uh, uh, Julia asked Newt, he said, what would you like for Father's Day? And he said, I'd like a tractor, a painting of a tractor. And Julia's answer to him was, I don't do tractors. <laughs> and she does it. She does lands, uh, farms, landscape houses. She does a great job. Uh, but she did. Newt wanted uh, one out, and he got the, uh, his uh, painting. And they did that uh, painting in uh, 74, I believe. Because I, I was there and interviewed Julia and her husband. And uh, it's a great story. They, uh, <clears throat> they did that in 74. And then in, in uh, 86, they had prints made of it. And that's what this is, a print. Does anybody own any of this, a print like this? Oh, got two. Great. I can sell everybody else on this one then. <laughs> <laughs> they are for sale. I think Julia has them yet. But the, uh, it won a national award for excellence in printing. And she was quite proud of that. And I have all those copies of all those documents and that. And somehow, one of the vice presidents of Deere & Company, stuff, and he was a, a former vice president, he was... Um, a uh, professor at a Delaware College, he stopped in at, at Long Acres Dairy and he saw the print and he bought it and he donated it to the, the CEO of Deer and Company, Mr. Hansen. So that one of those prints is hanging in, the, in Moline. So in all that, she, she was very good and, gave, and documented all that. So that's one of my favorite tractors. This here is... Um, picture of the early A. We call it, it was called the open fan shaft. It's because that fan, the fan gets driven from the governor housing back uh, to front, and uh, that's why uh, it's, it's open. It just, it's open. The first, only the first years had that. And this, um, 
display is the um, display from the FFA kids. I have a better shot. There's a better display of it. Hold the mic up there, Donald. They can't hear no, you. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, there, great. This is the, um, th just, hey, just tell me that if I do something wrong, <laughs> which is a lot. <laughs> Okay, that in 2002, the Chevron Oil Corporation uh, had a contest, they do every year, and kids from the high school all across the nation uh, participate in this if they want to, and they uh, restore a, a tractor, and they came to me and wanted to know if I had one to restore. Well, I thought if I picked one of the ugliest ones I had, and one that was pretty rare, it would give a better chance of them winning something. So that's the finished product that they got. The, uh, they came, they became the, in the top 10 in the nation. They went to Kentucky and they, were, they got, the, got in the top 10. Now, if I can find my notes, I wanted to recognize those five individuals. They did such a super job of... Um, Brian Pfeiffer was the coach, and we want to uh, give thanks to Jeremy Deicher, the FFA advisor. And the, and the five young men that did it is Justin Aller, Travis Mays, Mark Kelschner, Brian Piper Jr., and Brian Mauger. I and think uh, Brian Piper is here. He holds up his hand where he sit. Really? <laughs> hey, great. <laughs> you deserve that. You deserve that. It's a great program. And somehow, a, a blue John Deere got in that picture. <laughs> this is another photograph of that uh, same tractor. It's a GP wide tray, is the designation of it. Okay, here's the domestic gasoline engine I was talking about, and you can see the name plates up there. This was sold by my great grandfather, and uh, it, what happened to it, it was sitting in a in a butcher house on the second floor, and the butcher house burned and it fell down to the first floor. <laughs> so it was, in, it was in bad shape. There must have been enough grease on the top of the nameplates because it did not ruin those brass nameplates. So I was very lucky. That's a picture of the Oilers and a little bit better picture. That's 1915. That's a, an, old, uh, an old engine. We took this one because it has the grassland lugs on it. It's a GP, but it has the grassland lugs. They're a little on the rare side. The one on the, uh, on the uh, far right, that is one of the, uh, not the rarest, but one of the most rare tractors that I have. That is a GP white tread, and that has the overhead steer. This, this they built just before they built the John Deere A. So, that was one of my real early restorations. I call this my Cracker Barrel shot. It looks like, like Cracker Barrel in there with all the stuff. If you look at the straight, in the center of the photograph is the Waterloo Boy. Now, this is one of the later Waterloo Boys. And you can, the reason you can tell that, the gas tank is elevated. Those brackets that the gas tank set on is a little bit higher than the, the other ones were much shorter. And what would happen is they found out and the tractor would go up a hill and would run out of gas. <laughs> so they, that's how they fixed it. The next models, they just put a, uh, a longer uh, base on those tanks. And then, when a, there's another blue tractor. They made those from 69 to 71. And it wasn't a commercial success. The, uh, what would happen is the dealer would get the, the tractors in the uh, white they were all white, and then you'd have like four different hoods. And uh, it, the idea was the, uh, the wife could come in and pick out the color tractor she wanted. <laughs> it didn't work, they didn't sell. <laughs> okay, this is another Cracker Barrel shot. Uh, John Deere made bicycles. How many people knew that John Deere made bicycles? Hey, look at that, that's great. I got a good John Deere crowd here. The uh, bicycles that are hanging there, are, I have them all hanging by the, and you never hang a bicycle by the, the wheel because they can get egg-shaped. So these are all hanging by the, the frame. But uh, they made two series of bicycles. 
1894 to 1900. Those are extremely rare. Uh, that's like buying an antique car. I'll never own one of those. But I have most of the other kind. The blue one is the most rare. In 1924, they came out with the, the John Deere D. Now this was the, really the first tractor to bear the John Deere name. And the first two years they had spoked flywheels. I don't know if you can see that photograph too well, but the, it's open. And that one there is a 1925, and that one's a 24-inch spoke flywheel. Now, before this, they uh, made a 26-inch spoke flywheel the first year. They didn't make many of them. But when you would make a left-hand, when you make a left-hand turn, the front wheel would hit the flywheel <laughs> while it was turning. Not a very good idea. So they changed that and uh, they cut it down by two inches. This is a Model W gas engine. Uh, they made over 4,000 of them. It was a very heavy engine. It was used in uh, lumber mills, um, oil fields, uh, something that required really heavy horsepower. Most of them were worked to death. Most of them were scrapped uh, during World War II for the casting. Uh, there aren't too many. This one here is a fairly early one. I'm standing on the photograph just to show how tall this tractor is. This is a John Deere high crop, and this is also a fairly rare one. They only built 128 of this model, and it was used down south uh, for sugarcane and a lot of the southern crops. Uh, I bought it from a fellow that uh, did cultivated Christmas trees. Okay. This uh, John Deere G. This one is a high rack. When they built this, they didn't realize that the, it, was, it would get hot. And it got too hot. So they solved this by putting a higher radiator on it. This one here is the high radiator. And I'm pointing out the low radiator in this one. The low radiators are very uh, rare. They're tough to find. But that was because most of them were changed. But that's an original one. What we have here is a GM John Deere. Now, they started making the G in 42. Now, those of you who know your history, of course, we're talking World War II. And there was a, a, war, a restriction uh, during World War II. They could not increase the price of any uh, tractor that was being built. If it was a brand new tractor with a new name, they could increase the price, but they could not increase the price if it was a, um, an existing, uh, existing model. So what John Deere did was, instead of a G, they called it a GM. They just put an M in front of it. So they, that was a new model then. So they could increase the price. Then after the war, they changed it back to a G. <laughs> Supposedly it said G modernized, but that was the reason they uh, did it. This is a, uh, the, they built the John Deere A in 1934, which I have one of those, and this one is a 35B. But if you'll take notice in the front, it only has four bolts holding that pedestal fast. That was uh, the characteristic of the first, and this one I'm, is still work in progress. I don't have the correct magneto on this one yet. I have a lot of things that are work in progress. <laughs> this one, is uh, my father purchased from Walter Levan. Walter Levan was a master machinist. How many people knew Walter? See, look at this, great. He was a master machinist, and this was the only tractor in his collection. He had a lot of gas engines, but only one tractor, and my dad bought it from him, and we'll always keep this one. Uh, what's unique about this one is an unstyled one. Uh, it's the first year they built them and it's the first utility tractor that they built, and it's the first tractor they built without a John Deere engine. That has a Hercules engine in it. That's our old Henry forklift. We used that around the, uh, the business for years, and then I saved it. Uh, Henry's out of business long already. It's on a 430 John Deere tractor. 
and you can see Ole Legion Diner's sign behind there, the Coca-Cola sign there. This is the, uh, before we incorporated in 74, this is the sign that was up there. I, this I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed this. This here, I bought at a flea market. A fellow was in the service, and every time he'd get to a different state, he'd get a different license plate, of course, but he always had a holy on it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a great hobby that I enjoy, and uh, it's great for one reason and one reason alone. You people here, you people here in, in front, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here. I will, if anybody has any questions, I'll try and answer them now. My grandfather owned a car called the Vealy, V-E-L-I-E, and that was supposedly made by John Deere. They were in the car business for a couple of years. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, the Vealy is a very collectible car. Uh, that was a direct relative of, Deere and, of, of John Deere. John Deere, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think the, uh, the relationship, uh, really was in quite a bit but, uh, of manufacturing. I think they even made an airplane once. The, uh, Charles Deere, John Deere's son, never had any boys. There was always girls in the family, and that's where the Vealy came in. One of them, one of the girls married a Vealy, and that's how that, yeah, that's, uh, I saw some of those already. Uh, it's a nice piece. Anybody else have any questions? Donald. Yes. Uh, those early pictures of the tractors, and this might be a dumb question. There is no such thing as a dumb well, question. Sometimes when it comes out of my mouth, it is. But, uh, <laughs> when did rubber get on, uh, starting to be used on the wheels? Uh, I think it's 1937. I'm not sure. I might be wrong on that, but I do know the company that was the first company to come out with the factory rubber, and that was Alice Chalmers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know for sure. It'd be the, the mid to late 30s. If anybody can correct me on that. But I know Alice was the first one to have rubber tires. Anybody else? Okay, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the program. I really am not a public speaker, but uh, we do our best. Thank you. <laughs>